Traveling the Vortex. We've joined the Doctor as he travels the Vortex and arrive at episode 431, which also is part of Harry's imagination. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Glenn. How are you guys? Harry's got a pretty dull imagination this time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, pinball us, you know. (laughs) Oh, the pinball was cool. What'd you you guys do this week? Not a whole lot. Cleaned up my gutters. Last two weeks, because we're uh, actually a week off now, because we yeah, that's we, true. We couldn't couldn't collaborate again last week <laughs> because we all were so busy, chaotic. So chaotic's a good word. <laughs> Did you guys I do anything fun in these two weeks? I saw uh, Mason and I last weekend went and saw Detective Pikachu. What did you think? It was cute. We enjoyed it. Um, he got a lot more out of it than I did because he knew, he knew a lot of more of the references, but I knew a good number of them playing the Pokemon Go game for so many years. It's kind of where we came down on it. It was cute, but not uh, I, it, not anything else. I mean, it borrows heavily from Bat- Batman '89 and Zootopia, but <laughs> I mean, big heavily borrows from Batman '89 and Zootopia. But huh. um, I could see the just from the trailers, I could see Zootopia. I'm kind of surprised by Batman '89. You, you, you'll know what I mean when you see it. <laughs> if I see it, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, it, it's worth seeing. I think it's they they did it the right way. They did it so that more of a mainstream audience could go and enjoy it. They could still chalk it full of Pokemon references, but j- the average movie goer could go and still com- mm. completely enjoy the stories. So. I might pick it up at the library. Mason totally called the ending though. So, hmm. did you guys see anything? Um, I saw Pokemon and. John Wick 3. I don't think we talked about that. Mm-mm. How is John Wick 3? I don't think it's quite as good as John Wick 2, but only marginally not as good as John Wick 2. It's still a, a, an outstanding entry in the series. There's still a lot more world building, and uh, they're continuing that uh, layer upon layer upon layer of, of, of what an interesting thing this is. I uh, I could say I think honestly the 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 shoot 'em up element to it is maybe getting slightly dull and repetitive just because John Wick is so efficient at it <laughs> that you know the body count I, I read somewhere that he has now killed more people than Freddy Krueger and <laughs> uh, Jason put together when it's kind of like well duh uh, <laughs> <laughs> those were always one by one victims I mean it's not yeah. like it was. Right. A shooting spree. But, um, you know, if, if the title of the movie was John Wick Kills Everybody, I'd still have pony up my cash to go see it because I enjoyed the other two. So. Right. But, no, it's it's good. Hmm. Keith, did you see anything? Didn't watch anything. All right. Well, should we move on to news? News. We start with some sad news tonight. Uh, Stephen Thorne has passed away at the age of 84. So those who may not recognize the name... Uh, he had three large roles as villains. It's three large villains. Three very large villains uh, in classic Doctor Who. Azal, Omega, and Eldrad, right? Yep. He, that was the third one? Male Eldrad, anyway. Male Eld, yes. Yeah. Sean and I got to um, sit down and talk with him. Oh, gosh, it's been about eight years ago now, but uh, when we went to Gallifrey together one year, so he will be missed. And you know, it's uh, maybe it's because of that, but but seeing that news, this feels like just the biggest gut punch. Um, he was the sweetest man. He was uh, a larger than life personality, um, and yet he he was just very easy to talk to. I mean, he was friendly. He was warm. He was inviting. He genuinely loved Doctor Who and Doctor Who fandom. And I'm sure we asked probably some of the same questions that he had been asked a zillion times, and it didn't phase him at all. No. I mean, just answered all of them with a smile. Very gracious man. <laughs> and um, I, I, I hope that he's, uh, he's with uh, Nicholas Courtney at the big pub up in the sky, because, mm-hmm. man, he could drink anybody under the table <laughs> at Galley. So. <laughs> he I, will I, be greatly missed. I hope they're having a laugh. Let's move on to something happier. 
possibly, depending on how you feel about this next <laughs> adversary. Uh, the BBC, oh, you're looking at me, aren't you? <laughs> yep. The BBC has announced that the Jadoon will return to face off against the 13th Doctor. I like the mohawk on the Jadoon. <laughs> it's a good look. Doesn't make it any more. It's, it's a familiar look. Sounds like Bebop. Yeah. Mm, oh no, Rocksteady. There you go. Rocksteady. Although I think Bebop was the one that had the Mohawk. Bebop, yeah, Bebop did have them. It's a, it's a meld, it's a of, meld Bebop of the two of them. Rocksteady. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to say anything. You know, I, I actually have less issue with it than I think people expect. It's an established Doctor Who species now, so you know, I've kind of made my peace with the fact that it's a rhino, but. <laughs> Um, I'll be interested to see where they go. Uh, it's just, it seems to me, the only thing that is a little disheartening of it is that they, BBC, first of all, felt it necessary to show us, hey, look, classic monster coming back after beating the drum all year last year of no returning monsters. Yeah. You know, it all, it's almost feel like the BBC felt like, oh, that was a misstep. So Let's we're going to, we'll, 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 we'll shove this out. Well, even if it, it do we know that this is the first episode of the series? No, we that's, don't know anything about and it. And that's the thing is this this will probably be like four, eight in, and maybe by that time we'll be ready for the return. But it's almost like they're like, oh, uh, guess what? We're, we're bringing familiarity back to the show. Uh, it's, so. it's almost like they announced, uh, you know, Mondazi and Cybermen for the, before the series even began. Well, <laughs> you know, it's a little different. but Well, and furthermore, hey, now I'm going to talk about it. I would just uh, rather <laughs> been more surprised by it. The, the, There's okay. no surprises anymore. I would just get past that. The, 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 <laughs> but it's not like this is like in public. The picture. There, there are multiple issues done. here. One, the Jadoon, at least from a plot standpoint, have never really been adversaries. Mm-hmm. They've been obstacles. Right. But they're they're right. not necessarily bad. I mean, they're, they're, be, they're the police force, and they may not be in this one either. And so you know they show up and they kind of do their jobs, and they're very rigid and strict about their jobs. But they're not bad guys. Um, so I would hesitate to even call them adversaries That's unless true. you come up with a very interesting way to make them the adversary. Secondly, of all of the returning Who's monsters... calling them adversaries? I didn't read the... Oh, I don't know. I might have just... I, I, I just fandom in general. Oh, are they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This, this say, article says uh, most fearsome I think, adversaries. I, I called them monsters, but I wouldn't call them villains or adversaries. Um, of all of the possible returning monsters that they could go back to the well and grab... The Jadoon? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, and I, it's not like the Slovene. It's not like, you know, they're, they were going back and grabbing the Scribble Monster and going, look what's making a return. <laughs> but the Jadoon do not necessarily inspire a level of, ooh, it, for me. They're just kind of a, ah, all right. It's not even really a, noseworthy, a newsworthy event. It's just kind of, if they showed up in the episode and they hadn't said anything, it would be, oh, cool, the Jadoon are back. Because that's the level of excitement I have for the Jadoon. <laughs> So the fact that they made an event out of it is almost, okay, that's what you've got in store for next season, huh? It, it, I, it, it's not confidence it, it boosting for me. It makes me hope that he's doing some sort of misdirect, that he's doing, that if he's bringing something else back or doing something bigger, that he's trying to distract everyone by, hey, look, Jadoon, while well, I'm off over here doing this I thing. suspect that he's not, has anything to do with the marketing of it. I just, well, I, no. I have a feeling that somebody... They had a Jadoon story, and the BBC said, "Ooh, let's dangle that out in front of fans." We haven't had much news about the new series yeah, in a while, so let's put something out there that we can do. And you know, I, I get from the BBC's perspective they they've got a they've got a product to promote, and they need to advertise it. And hey, the Jadoon—that's something we can license and yeah. slap on a plastic lunchbox and well, sell. It, and so. it's something that we can have a news article about without getting into details of what's happening in the season. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you can do an announcement about, hey, look, there's this new monster we're going to have, because then you're going to have to give the entire story of what's going on with the monster or some sort of tidbit, which Chib- Chibnall's not going to want to do. It's, you know, it's or even worse, do. you build the monster up. Can you imagine a, oh, my God, wait until you guys meet Tim Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. going to be the scariest thing you have ever seen on Doctor Who. And we all would have went, ooh, he gave us this little tidbit without any real information. I can't wait to see that episode. And then how upset would we have been? It's That's mean, true. Yeah. Who knows? In a year's time, maybe we'll be going, oh, that was a really great episode. So, 
Big Finish has done a great Jadoon story. I'm just saying, with the Sixth Doctor. I hope. Maybe anything I, I I'm the eternal optimist. I hope that I am wrong. <laughs> I want. I want to be knocked out of my chair, going, "Wow, that was fantastic!" Every week. <laughs> That's right. All right. What else is on the list? Uh, they have also announced a new VR film that's launching in the UK. This is just on the heels of the Runaway releasing. It's going to be called The Edge of Time. I believe there's a trailer you can go watch. Has anybody watched this trailer? I have not yet. I have not either. This is news to me. I have not. Heard, I did not hear about uh, a second one. So yeah, it's the same style animation. Um, so it's kind of a just a follow up. Apparently, they've had enough success with the first one. Well, good. Yeah. Last but not least, Candy Jar Books has announced the winner of the Lethbridge Story Short Lethbridge Stewart Short Story Competition. The winning story J- Gone Fishing is written by Megan Fizzle from Maine in the USA. Congrats, Megan. Congratulations. So that will be a part of the collection number short story collection number 2 which will be coming out soon. And they've announced the list of stories, and you can go on their website and check those out. Very good. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to move on to feedback, but we don't have any feedback this week because we've, <laughs> we've got to do a little bit of house cleaning, and uh, we've got Jameson in the wings, and we'll bring back some more feedback of his next week. But uh, we're kind of we're, we're hip deep in feedback right now, and so we're doing some sorting. So, And we had so much news that we thought... Let's get on to our review. That's right. And we have so much to talk about. What is our review? Do we? Doctor Who. <laughs> Scratch <laughs> Man. <laughs> the long gestating, <laughs> often <laughs> promised, several times rescheduled <laughs> review of Scratch Man. <laughs> Sometimes mistitled in our uh, schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for sure this thing was called Doctor Who meets Scratch Man. It is not. <laughs> nope. It's just... Doctor Who colon scratch. Imagine my surprise when I opened it up and went, huh, colon. (laughs) (laughs) No lie. (laughs) Well, you can translate the colon to mean meats. (laughs) Went back, looked at the cover, went back and looked at, nope. (laughs) Where did I see that at? I don't know. I'm just making things up now. (laughs) My apologies to any listeners who were confused. Well, there's a reason behind that. We'll go over it. (gasps) What are you afraid of? In his first ever Doctor Who novel, Tom Baker's incredible imagination is given free reign. A story so epic it was originally intended for the big screen. Scratchman is a gripping white knuckle thriller almost 40 years in the making. The Doctor, Harry, and Sarah Jane Smith arrive in a remote Scottish island when their holiday is cut short by the appearance of strange creatures. Hideous scarecrows who are preying on the local population. The islanders are living in fear and the Doctor vows to save them all. But it doesn't go to plan. The time travelers have fallen into a trap, and Scratch Man is coming for them. Mm-hmm. With the fate of the universe hanging in the balance, the Doctor must battle an ancient force from another dimension, one who claims to be the devil. Scratch Man wants to know what the Doctor is most afraid of, and the Doctor's worst nightmares are coming out to play. I'm not sure how to review this. What do you mean? Well... It's broken into two books. Two very distinctly different books. Two very distinctly different books. And if I were to review book one, I might give it the biggest of the big dun-dun-dun's I could possibly bestow on a Doctor Who novel. Setting, tone, voice, almost everything about it was, was... I, I thought just spot on and and very well done. I'm not a huge fan of first person narration. It's a bit odd and it takes a little bit to get used to, especially for Doctor Who. And I didn't mind it from the fact that, you know, obviously it's Tom, so if anybody's going to narrate the Doctor in first person, he's a large enough personality he can pull it off. But one of the things that bothers me about first-person narration is when you then proceed to tell me what's going on with people and characters in another part of the story that you were not present for. 
yeah, but the, the nice <laughs> thing is they the frame this in a reason it, why yeah. it's in first person, and, they, and they, then they also yeah address he, he addresses uh, what's it. happening. They, even they even they the do. Time Lords kind of get after him for well, wait a minute, how are how are you presuming or telling us what other people were thinking? And they do, and the the framing device with him being uh, interrogated by the Time Lords was was relatively clever, and the excuse that was offered up for why he's able to know what's going on it worked but it, it still it rankled me every time we would cut away to something else and it's still in first person that it's like this shouldn't work this shouldn't work this shouldn't work and yet here we are so I kind of really had a, an issue with that other than that I thought everything in the first half of the book just clicked for me it really moved at a good pace I thought it, I thought it was genuinely scary the scarecrows were frightening. The devices behind the scarecrows were frightening. Everything was, it was just, it was just going. And then the Cybermen showed up. And suddenly it went, ooh. And then it went, ah. Because the Cybermen weren't the bad guys. And I was kind of glad that they weren't the bad guys. But then the second book is Scratchman. And then it got existential and weird. <laughs> <laughs> and some really big ideas that I don't think gelled. There, were, there was a lot of stuff on the page and some very big, as they say, big screen motion picture kind of in scope. Um, certainly visual effects wise <laughs> um, sequences that the storytelling just, I don't think, quite lived up to what was there. And most importantly, Scratchman is a villain. I, he, he was he was corporate he was a he was a corporate villain he fell down for being built up as this insidious horrible scary evil thing that the time lords are supposed to be scared of he was not and there was one moment of oh i'm, I'm actually kind of concerned for the doctor and then that went away and it, it never came back for me and i just was kind of waiting through the end of the story to get to find out okay, how are you going to outsmart him? And, and so I, I kind of felt like well, if this had been a two-part television episode, it was like part one was much better than part two. <laughs> it's as funny usual. that you say that because the first part of this book I thought was meandering and typical. Oh, for God's sake. No, it really, it really was. I, I, I felt like if, if my best description of this story is part one is a television story. Yes. Part two is a film. But yeah, that's no, exactly, I'll agree with that's that. That's exactly how I looked at it. The part one was was it was good and interesting, but it was it was meandering. There wasn't a lot going on. There wasn't anything different that any other Doctor book, Doctor Who book has, or or even television uh, show has not done before. There were menacing times. There was there you know you, you, there was times that you wondered you know are we going to get out of this? The visualization of of uh, Sarah Jane's trying to escape the the evil black. Sh a shadow and the scarecrow in the TARDIS I thought was phenomenal I completely enjoyed that I love the representation of the um, tower being a, a giant grandfather clock mm -hmm. and the t the cloister bell being a phonograph record uh, on you know a record on a phonograph I thought that was that was so cool we've never seen the cloister bell you know at least related that way before and I thought that was very very interesting and as soon um, as it was described it was like well, of course it is. I, it just clicked. Yeah. It was like, yeah, yeah. Other than that, I just really kind of felt like it was a, a run-of-the-mill Doctor Who story. Um, when they actually go to hell, <laughs> although it doesn't end up being hell, and I'm, I'm glad that it ends up being kind of this trans-dimensional tra trans uh, explanation for how Doctor Who meets the devil, you know, because essentially that, well, that was Tom Baker and, and uh, uh, Ian, Martyr. Ian Martyr's original idea. Well, what happens if the doctor meets the devil? Um, so once we got into that world and the the doctor showing, especially the fourth doctor showing vulnerability, I thought was a great way to take the character because you don't get a chance to see that with the fourth doctor. And so his journey to find his friends, I thought was very interesting. Um, the the allusions to the River Styx, uh, you know, the ferryman being a cab driver, the um, especially when it's divulged later that the Cyberman was actually trying to help him and not attack them, <laughs> uh, was was quite interesting as well. The floating castle in the sky that was being 
upheld by the, the you know the torture and, and sacrifice of the minions of Scratchman I thought was good. I thought the visualization of Scratchman as a corporate man, cor- corporate businessman that you know rules this world in, in as an as an autocratic society I thought was was very very cool or bureaucratic society I thought it was very very cool. Um, co- making copies of himself as his yes man was was very entertaining and very interesting concept I thought. Um, the giant pinball game, the, you know, uh, what'd you do, Ray? You know, I just, what, you know, yeah. <laughs> Harry imagining that, thinking that that's quite harmless and end up being, you know, the device that, that, that Scratchman uses in order to um, try to, you know, battle them. I, I thought that was really good. I just, I, I and the, the whole time that I'm reading this second part, I could see it as a movie. I couldn't see it as a major motion picture now. But I could completely visualize it as a 1970s science fiction film, and I thought that's what I I think that that kind of captured me as well is that it really felt like I could have seen this have been made in the 70s. The the special effects wouldn't have been great, the film would have been dated by this point, but I could totally see what they saw from what they experienced with film back in the 1970s and, and why it was sort of gone this way. Um, so much I was so interested that they I went back and read the synopsis because there never ever was a actual script for Doctor Who and the Scratchman, no matter what it meets the Scratchman, no matter what what they say. Um, but he and Ian Martyr had discussed this in great detail. Um, Tom Baker kept this idea close to him for years, and interestingly enough, the book stays relatively faithful to the concepts and ideas that were put forth in the original story that they would have ended up coming over here and selling it was it universal that they were trying to they were courting I it think to. that's what I had heard yeah. uh, the Cybermen obviously were not Cybermen but they were a cyborg race or a cybernetic race um, the Daleks would have made an appearance in it um, and the pinball table I believe was the big finale for the, the, the film but uh, other than that, I think there was a lot of things that still translated over. I think the things that I found very interesting about it was the heavy-handed, and not necessarily badly heavy-handed, but the heavy-handed references to the mythos, which I completely expected Tom Baker to step away from. And I suspect that a lot of that is the influence of uh, James Goss, who basically ghost-wrote this for him. Um, I think Tom had a lot of hand in writing it. Don't get me wrong. This is Tom's work. This is Tom's story. But I, I think James Goss put a lot of the touches on it. I think uh, anything that had to do with um, the his previous doctors, uh, uh, previous incarnations, I think was probably an influence from Goss. Obviously, changing the Cybermen or the Cyborgs to Cybermen uh, was probably Goss's idea. I think there was a lot of, uh, especially meeting with the mysterious Time Lady <laughs> on the shore at the end, was probably uh, a was James Goss influence. Nice but it was nice for Tom. It it was uh, to me. Tom allowing that in this book, or or if or if he and I can't say that it was all Goss, but I'm just speculating, but it, or whether him either him you know being okay with his inclusion or him maybe bringing that was another reassurance for me that Tom Baker is a pass the torch kind of guy and feels like you know Jody fits in this world just as well as any other Doctor, and so I think that that was that was very cleverly done. Um, and it was a beautiful the, moment too, not only in it how was. it was handled at the end, but I didn't realize. It was a, that was the second time she'd shown up, yeah. wasn't it? There, I didn't realize it was her earlier, up earlier. Yeah. and yeah. I had to go back and reread that passage and go, "Oh, this makes a lot more sense now." That I yeah. know this. <laughs> <laughs> because it was just some random party goer to me, yep. and Uh-oh. even though all the clues are there, all the hints are there, I'm not quite sure why I missed it, but right? Well, there was even a snark, a little bit of a snark towards the Tenth Doctor in that party's passage also. There was mm-hmm. a little bit, yep. Um, so all of those little things that tied into, you know, the 50-plus years of the mythos, I think, was, was a nice touch and a nice added detail to something that could easily have been Tom of old wanting to isolate himself in the part and not, you know, bring a lot of the things that, that maybe he didn't feel... Or would have might be drawn attention from his doctor, so I, I was very pleased with that, especially knowing this would have been an adaptation of something that he, adaptation of something that he had originally conceived back in the seventies when it was all about him. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so I was very pleased by that. But no, I I, I think the, the the second half is when it when it for me is when it picks up and it really gets exciting and interesting and and yes, a bit esoteric and a bit um, uh, kind of out there um, visually and conceptually. But I, I really enjoyed that because it was, they were doing something different with Doctor Who that I'm used to, and so. It was almost it, land of fiction. Yeah. Well, well and the, 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 a it even gets bit, to a point where for, the pinball game it, oh, it feels a lot like Celestial Toymaker. It I does to totally a point. The, yeah. The In fact, Celestial I could Toymaker imagine doing that. Yeah, I could imagine him. Yeah, implementing something like that. Um, I so, kinda, no, I, I, I liked that amount, amount of it. I kind of come in between the two of you where. I thoroughly enjoyed the first half because it felt like a standard Doctor Who story, and I was afraid that Tom would try to take a Douglas Adams approach to it, and I was glad that he didn't. It felt like a very strong standard Doctor Who story, and I enjoyed that ride immensely all the way through. And then once we hit Scratch Man, I struggled with the story and the weird settings and what felt like randomness until we actually met Scratch Man. And then everything else at, leading up to that kind of clicked into place, and I understood what he was trying to do. But once he meets Scratch Man, and things go forward from there, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I had I really didn't have many issues with the book after that. It's kind of an Omega concept. It's a, it's a it really is. man or a being that controls his own world. And while you could argue that that's well, that's standard Doctor Who, but I just think uh, in in scope it was such so much more grand than what they they did on television with omega so it's omega and the celestial toy maker rolled into one yeah certainly i think maybe maybe that's why because and i'm i'm sure a lot of this was probably ian martyr's influence as well um but i i, I mentioned the voice and having having sarah sound like sarah and having Harry especially because we've gotten more Sarah Jane stories Mm -hmm. whether through the Sarah Jane adventures or you know Sarah's come back and and guest starred on Doctor Who we didn't get any more Harry right we're not going to get the opportunity for more Harry that's just kind of where well we'll read Harry Sullivan's The War but that's Sans the Doctor (laughs) right (laughs) I'm sure there's companion chronicles out there with Harry in them but plus we got that uh, wonderful fourth Doctor uh story with Harry. But and he's not reprising his he's role. He's not reprising his role. I know what there, you there, mean. There, I know what you mean. And so to have a new Harry Sullivan story that really felt like a Harry Sullivan story. Well, that sounded like a Harry Sullivan story. And a Harry Sullivan story that didn't treat Harry like the imbecile. Yes. Because so many times they just go along that imbecile route with the character even though he's obviously not and Tom doesn't take that approach at all. He makes him, he plays to Tom, uh, Harry's strengths. In fact, they they, they poke fun at it well, in a he, way. Oh I yeah, because he, he totally calls him out on it, but yet he's not. Yeah, as right. you say, he, he, they they strike a nice balance with not diverging from the character of Harry Sullivan, but also giving him some credit for um, who he is and his nobility and his you know um, steadfastness and. His loyalty, I think, is it all comes across. And, oh and yeah, the, n- nothing was more evident than the line Harry missed his coat <laughs> because Sarah Jane was wearing it. Right, right. You know, and it's just because that's who he was. You know, and, and that to me was wonderful. And so that's why the the first half of that it very much feels like this easily could have slipped in at any point in time in that first season or before uh, Terror of the Zygons. Well, it did. Uh, and apparently, fact, I get, after I get or the even impression after, yeah. because no, it she been talks after. about being chased by the Loch Ness monster. Well, she does say that, but yeah. it couldn't be because Harry leaves at the end of Saigon. So. Well, he leaves production officially, but he still shows up in. Uh, yeah, but he leaves traveling with the Doctor. He only shows up in the uh, fake, Auton. in the fa- no, no uh, not invasion, Auton. Android, uh, invasion. Android invasion. But he fo- he shows up as foe Harry Sullivan, so right. it's not right. even him. So. But um, so it, it, it just it, it felt very much like it fit there. But the second half of the book, it's interesting that you said that, because it did feel a little more Douglas Adamsy. It did feel a little more out there, a little more... But not played for humor. Not play, no, well, not played me, for humor. To me, but, it felt more like James Goss. It felt, it felt like grounded... It felt like James Goss not trying to be Douglas Adams, is what it felt like to me. It felt like yeah, a lot I of things we've got from Goss. Where I think Goss is, has, is very imaginative. 
I think he has a very good scope of imagination, and I think that's why he handles Douglas Adams so well, because he can inject the same kind of humor, and he also has the vision that Adams had. So I think that's where that comes from. I but, don't even think it was very much Adamsy as it was James Goss. Yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to misquote or miss say that you know it, it felt like a Douglas Adams adventure, because it didn't. But it could have been an adventure in the same stylings of a Douglas Adams adventure without the humor. It's not as over-the-top madcap, but it is on the same level of weirdness, if that makes sense. But then when you put Tom Baker's Fourth Doctor into that madcap weird adventure, my brain's automatically going to associate it back to a Douglas Adams you, you know, completely Romana. Missed the, you completely missed the point of Douglas Adams. Then that's what that tells me. But, but, but what I'm saying is, it, 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 it I know what it you mean. Feels by more like a later but I don't era think Tom. I don't think it's, for that particular story. Arc. Maybe yeah, but you've got like Destiny Sarah and Harry in or, it. And it does it, almost yeah. have an E space almost feel to it with the big idea behind it, like yeah. meeting the great vampires or Warriors Gates of you know this. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. I, Post I, Adams as well, though. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> a later era Tom. Yeah. Maybe that's a better way to describe yeah. it than, than, than Douglas Adamsy. But um, because you tend to literalize every time I say Douglas <laughs> Adams, you say, well, it's well, not Douglas Adams. Like, that's not what I, I think, meant. Uh, unfortunately, people tend to, and, and this is going to sound very, I don't know, snooty of me, but too many people <laughs> use Douglas Adams as an example for things that are not very Douglas Adams. And I think that that's where I struggle with it because Adams puts such a mark on it that I, I just, too many people go to Douglas Adams. Oh, it's very, that's very Douglas Adams. Well, it's not, very, it's not Douglas Adams because Douglas Adams stuff is very different from this. And if you don't see it, then you've missed what's important. Same thing with Pratchett though. I would say the same thing is that people, people compare works to Terry Pratchett stuff, then they don't, they, they, they you're not getting out of Terry Pratchett. What, you know, Right, People no, and I, and I agree with you, but I, I also think you you are an Adams scholar. You, you're, 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 scholar. Well, you're 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 certainly a snob. <laughs> and, 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 I am an Adams Adam snob. Yes, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean you're you're, you're Douglas Adams snob. And when I say it's Douglas Douglas Adams ish, I, I'm not saying that it's you ish, know, not esque, right? <laughs> That's okay. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So. When, when it, it just it just the second half feels more like a latter era Tom adventure, but then when you still have Harry Sullivan and Sarah Jane in it, it, it is jerking me back out of the story mm. because the setting is wrong. The first half is very much a Sarah Jane and and Harry adventure. It's back into that kind of Hammer horror ripoff feel, which is still later. <laughs> which is still later, but it it, it, it lends itself more to something that you could see them doing. Well, the yeah. bridge is nearer. The bridge is nearer. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's Sarah Jane is certainly there for the majority of those. Some I mean, those, you know, yeah. uh, Brain of Morbius and yeah, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but um, th- this very much feels more like a Romana. And a Romana too at that. Um, but is that because because I don't of. see those stories even in Romana's... I, 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 don't even, I can't even compare those. The, the things that I can compare to those type of things would be going to the Douglas Adams stories would be something like maybe City of Death maybe Pirate Planet maybe you know again hitting, hitting the, Planet than hitting the board well I mean just that kind of it's, conceptually I mean the, I mean <laughs> the Jaggeroff going back you know conceptually and landing yes in, yeah that's setting what I'm saying. Wise, that, that, no. no no not yeah. setting not yeah. setting at all conceptualized um but I, I don't see, you know, Naimon or even the East, East Space trilogy. I mean, why Warrior's Gate probably would be the closest. But um, I don't see anything in Doctor Who that is anything like this. Well, the, the, so, the devil being a corporate raider and having a boardroom full of copies of himself. That to me is a Douglas-ish idea. That's something that I feel like Adams could have come up with and probably would have ran with it. And here it's a footnote. Well, I can see you that. Know, but the other or, thing or that it's I, more of a Pratchett-ish idea. Or it, Pratchett. Based yeah, off I, of I, maybe, maybe, maybe Pratchett's a better example. But Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. A, a good, I don't know how much of 
what from Good Omens is Pratchett and how much was Gaiman? Well, from what I've read, most of it is Pratchett. <laughs> and only, <laughs> only hints of it are uh, Gaiman. Um, but... But Pratchett never wrote for I Doctor Who, I, so I, I can't go there. There's right. there yeah. somebody. There, but it is kind of a nice let, same idea. Gaiman's a great example. Oh, Gaiman yeah. is this is the the second half of this is very Gaiman esque is what it is. Okay. Because while while Gaiman can inject humor as well as anybody else, Gaiman is more a visual visual you know a, a, a visionary, and then the comedy comes second nature for him. Whereas I think Pratchett and Douglas Adams were very much sarcasm and, and humor and the visual the, the 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 grand visual of things came second nature to them so i think that if i were to compare it to anybody it'd be neil gaiman's work okay i'll buy that so it felt more like a gaiman episode yeah. <laughs> well like you know sandman and those kind of things that right. even take more of a serious tone that's just yeah um the other thing that i i'm not i'm not, I'm not knocking you here but i did i want to stamp down on the fact that you think that Ian Martyr might have had some influence to maybe only in his relationship and personality to Tom Baker because this was something from what I understand was a project that they bantered about wasn't something that they had set down and formulated so and I think that's part of the reason why Ian Martyr doesn't get as much credit as maybe a lot of people feel he should with this book because I think the core of this idea came from the discussions that they had but ultimately i think tom carried it on with him and so i think that probably what we're getting is probably uh tom baker and ian martyr's relationship and the way that that harry performed that character rubbed off on uh tom's descriptions in this book right and so i think that's probably more more of it than ian lending any sort of character to it in the writing of this. No, so. no, I agree with that. I didn't have anything to add. All right, that's right. <laughs> um, to, to the extent that when we do get into the weird esoteric uh, pinball game and <laughs> the universe keeps finding ways to not kill Harry Sullivan <laughs> <laughs> and that's how the doctor knows he's still alive even after he's fallen through a, a, a drainage hole into a presumed lake of fire uh below the floating castle but the fact that it's you know there are neon signs over the devil's head saying terribly sorry about this <laughs> <laughs> that's just such a yeah it, it, it was a, a perfect moments mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of just yeah. the, the the best way i think to describe some of this i think the climax of the of Scratchman wanting to know what the doctor's fear is and they they really kind of kept this very the doctor keeps it very close to his chest throughout the entire story of what his true fear is and then in order to finally give it to him and that be the demise of Scratchman at the same time I thought was a nice touch knowing that that the doctor's fear was enough to topple Scratchman's world I thought was 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 very clever um and so i really like that about it and i think that's what that second part of the story really kind of drives home is the fact that you know while the doctor doesn't seem to be afraid of anything and he goes he rushes full-heartedly into his fear is ultimately and i can't even really describe it but his fear is what will happen ultimately to the world (laughs) And uh, so that's what ends up dragging Scratchman's world down is the fact mm-hmm. that uh, he transfers that fear to Scratchman, and Scratchman never had fear either. So and it treat, it treats them as equals. While the Fourth Doctor's um, very off-footing for most of the story, I think it ultimately does show the parallels of good and evil in this book and that's one of the things that i like too is the fact that you don't have to have um the david Tennant uh vengeful time lord you don't have to have the jody whitaker ultimate pacifist you don't have you know you you can have just a good person and you can have an evil person and they can face off and i and and, and they they really towards the end kind of balance each other and i thought i like that too well and what a fantastic room full of tortures for the doctor 
<laughs> we've got a party that everyone's going to ignore you. Yeah, we've yeah. got a, we've got a high inquisitor torture room that's going to you know, Make especially you the fourth there. doctor. Yeah. yeah, yeah, especially the fourth doctor. But I think any of them would have worked. I mean, we 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 saw the eleventh doctor go <laughs> bananas in Power of Three <laughs> because he was bored. <laughs> he was bored. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, imagine that that is your hell. That that's what awaits you is being bored. I, I cannot think of it. And it wasn't until they kind of spelled it out for him that I went, oh, that's what's going on. <laughs> oh, oh, that's just mean. <laughs> I mean, it, because it is that kind of terrible. Mm -hmm. um, but especially for the fourth doctor, because mm -hmm. the ego just doesn't allow for it. Right. Especially the party where no one's paying attention to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the seventh doctor, I don't think, would have fared well, um, you know, either. Not having a, a plot to... <laughs> No I, don't think, I don't think any of the oh, doctors would I have been. I think the seventh doctor, TV doctor, seventh TV doctor. I've been reading a lot of Virgin New Adventures, which really kind of explore the character differently. But um, I think the seventh TV doctor would have loved this. This would have been, this is really his element. I mean, it's it's the manipulation and the scheming that's coming against him, but he could turn turn the tables on. Turn the tables and, on. Yeah. And I, I think he would have. He didn't have been enjoying himself. <laughs> He'd have really been in enjoying himself. Yeah, I think this would have been a actually fairly good seventh and eighth sto story. But it's not. It's a really it's good not. fourth and <laughs> Sarah Jane. It's just a really good Harry. story. Really. I quite enjoyed it. Um and the the the, the sum of its parts ends up becoming a hole for me and I, I like it but I just it, it, it took me a while and I struggled with the first story really getting into it because while the scarecrows were scary they weren't scary enough and it just really felt like oh another Doctor Who story and I thought I, th the, the I was nice hoping Tom would have done better than this and then he did <laughs> the, one of the nice things I liked about the first story is we didn't travel away from our core three very often and that helped me carry through it too. Well, they each got something to do. Mm -hmm. um, Harry going to the um, shop to get the sugar, although, <laughs> again, very, you know, <laughs> accidentally yeah, living well, the entire exactly. time. Exactly, <laughs> fate, fate, <laughs> fate dealing <laughs> Harry his <laughs> hand in the way that it does. And uh, but Sarah's adventure, I thought through the, the TARDIS was amazing, and I really wanted to know more about the jigsaw room. And I kind of like that they tantalized us at the end by maybe sort of tying that story up there at the end with the epilogue. But I, uh, or it wasn't even epilogue; it was a was a postscript, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, tying that up just a little bit, but but still not giving away too much about that room. I thought was was okay. It was satisfying at that point. But when we got away from the jigsaw room and then didn't do anything about it or, or with it, the rest of the I would have thing. been upset if they hadn't given us that right. PS. If I, we hadn't got the, yeah. the the postscript, I think I would have been a lot more upset. The other thing that I thought uh, was 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 uh, telling was the fact that um, she sees herself in the future with a, a young boy, and so they're even you know acknowledge acknowledging yeah, that was another Sarah nice Jane adventures. And so that was really cool. I was a little worried when the first advanced scarecrow showed up um, and it's described as being kind of a, a cross between you know polished wood and, 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 and metal wow. because my first thought was that whatever the inky blackness was that has invaded the TARDIS has now used that to upgrade this because he, he comments that if we use a flamethrower on them they will become mm. flaming scarecrows if we use this because of this and then one of them is in the TARDIS okay so they've now the way that was described to me totally sounded like the wood paneling of the of the console room and it was like oh we're going to have a bunch of you know semi-sentient time traveling scarecrows running around where could you possibly go with this? this is a terrifying idea of these things being <laughs> able to just suddenly you know time and space is not an option they can springboard off the planet and then that's not what happened at all and i felt a little, a little let down <laughs> that wasn't the, i mean maybe that's too big of an idea to go with for the scarecrows but it would it would have been obviously a whole different story but right
I was also very pleased that we talked about Harry's voice, but I think he had Sarah's voice down really well also. Yes. And and so grateful that for all the peril Sarah Jane was in, there was only, I think, one scream that she let loose in the in the whole thing. And it, yeah. I mean, it was a worthy place to put it, too. But, uh, you know, she held her own through all of it. And yeah. I, was, I was so proud of of, of, of of Sarah and Tom and, and whoever else for, <laughs> yeah, no, we're not going there. <laughs> That's not her character, so. It was just, it was just a rousing adventure. I liked it. Probably one of the best fourth Doctor stories I've read. Not that I've read that many. I enjoyed it. All right, well. Anything else? What do we got coming up on the schedule, Sean? Well, coming up on the schedule next week. <laughs> we have to adjust all our dates now. Yeah, fortunately, they're not too different. Um, Everything's just delayed a week. Just, just, a, just delayed a week. Uh, next week, we've got a um, back to big finish, and we are doing uh, the return of the Eighth Doctor with uh, the beginning of season four with the Eighth Doctor Adventures, Death in Blackpool, and then a uh, special that uh, Big Finish put out called An Earthly Child. Although I'm convinced it fits very snugly right here in the middle of season four, so that's where I'm putting it, which is why we're reviewing it now. It works. And it works. Oh, have you? I've listened to both uh-huh. already. It works. And then uh, uh, the following week is the tenth Doctor, if I remember correctly. It's the following two uh, of the first season of the tenth Doctor audio adventures. I don't remember the titles of them off the top of my head, but it's uh, episodes two and three of tenth uh, Doctor season one. More information is available on our website. All right. Very good. Anything you we should add to uh, the show before we close it out? I don't think so. Uh, if you did read this, uh, go in and weigh in on the Goodreads Book Club because this was the book of the month for... May, wasn't it? Or was it April? I think it was April. Okay. Yeah. So go weigh in on your thoughts and give your review there. Speaking of reviews, I still forgot to do the my mini review of uh, Secret of Vault 13, so I'll I'm put, gonna put that on the schedule next week. I'm going to text you right now. and um, text me now, I won't. See it. See it. <laughs> I'll see it <laughs> now and then forget next week. Speaking of forgetting, um, we had augmented the schedule so that we would be reviewing the free comic book day, 13th Doctor, and uh, we have forgotten. So I think we can bump that to next week and cover it then. Sounds good. All Sounds right. good. We'll, we'll make a mental note. We'll cover it then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if it goes any better than Glenn's book review. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe we'll do those together. All right. Uh, if that's going to do it for this week, until next week, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. I'm Keith. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Be seeing you. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. No infringement is intended or implied.